Hi, it's Idris Elba here with Booking.com, and I wrote this poem about summer because I love summer. <clears throat> In summer, we do things to feed the soul, and Booking.com knows just how we roll. We love to swim and fish and barbecue. We love to read and nap and have a few. With cabins, resorts, yurts, and vacation homes, it's such a breeze to book. Where shall we roam? I know it needs some work, but thanks for listening. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for baking your way here on this toasty morning. Are you all ready to jam? Excellent. Before we get rolling, let's start by hashing out everything Bagel will be discussing. Profit margins are okay, but they could maybe be butter. Sorry, I don't mean to waffle. Next quarter, it's all or muffin. Did you have a question, sausage patty? Um, my name's Patricia. When you can't take your mind off breakfast, it matters where you stay. Delicious breakfast available at our Hilton family of brands. Hilton, for the stay. Storyworthy Media. The best in story-driven content. Hey, it's Christine Blackburn, and you're listening to Storyworthy. Welcome to Storyworthy. My name is Christine Blackburn, and I'm coming to you from my closet in Los Feliz, California. I am so happy you guys tuned in today. Whether you're a longtime fan of the show or a new listener, welcome to Storyworthy. Now, you may be wondering why I'm coming to you from my closet, and that's because today is a closet confessional. Yay! Now, as you guys know, about once a month, or whenever the urge hits me, I come into my closet and I bring you guys one of my own true stories, a closet confessional. And today is the second one. Now, the first one was titled, Me in Malibu, A Tale of Two Loves. And yeah, I know, it was kind of a downer. I get that. But today's will be a lot more lighthearted, and I think you guys are really going to like it. The bottom line is I'm getting a lot of emails from you guys, and the consensus is that you do want more closet confessionals. So here I am in my closet getting stabbed in the back by a hanger just for you. And now today's story is titled Confessions from a Stewardess. Now I think you guys are going to like this story because, first of all, we all have to fly. Whether we're on business or pleasure, it's very unlikely that you go through an entire year and not have to go to an airport. And we all know, like, the changes that have occurred over the last 15 years after 9-11. I mean, some are good, but mostly not so good. Mostly it's a lot of inconvenience, isn't it? Well, anyway, you're going to hear more about it in my story. But before I begin, I did want to remind you guys to follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Storyworthy. And why not head over to our website, storyworthypodcast.com, and join my mailing list. Yes, come on, you know you want that. All right, you guys, let's get right to my story. Now, this is the time in the show that I should be giving you my bio, but I feel really funny about doing that because you guys all know me anyway, and I know you. So if there's any confusion, you can go to christineblackburn.com. That ought to clear anything up. All right, you guys, let's do this thing. I was a flight attendant in the good old days, and by that, I mean pre-9-11. Back then, we were just getting used to being called flight attendants. Stewardess was still the more common job title. I was 23 years old, college was behind me, and I was waitressing at Tequila Junction, a Mexican restaurant in a shopping mall called Station Square in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. One day, I saw an ad in the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette announcing an open house for potential U.S. Air flight attendants. With my college-educated mind, it occurred to me, wait a second, if I could waitress on the ground, I could waitress in the air with benefits. I attended the open house at the Sewickley Country Inn along with a couple of hundred other potential candidates. We were each given one minute to stand up and speak, and based on that one minute, the airline would decide whether or not they wanted to interview you. And honestly, they only needed about 30 seconds, because everyone said the same thing. I love people. I love to travel. After about 40 of these responses, I could see the interviewers cringing. One girl actually got up and said, I love people, I love to travel, so I'm thinking, people, travel, flight attendant, am I right? No, no, you're not right at all. Finally, it was my turn. 
I stood up, and in my very confident 23-year-old voice, I said, I hate people. All eyes were immediately on me, but I know how to deal with them. I was called back for the interview and a physical. Then I was selected to attend the six-week flight attendant training program at the Royce Hotel in Moon Township, Pennsylvania, just outside of Pittsburgh. Now look, you take 200, mostly 20-somethings, and put them in a hotel for six weeks together? And talk about a reality show. It was basically a giant dorm with guys and girls running up and down the hallways in their underwear, (laughs) gossiping, sleeping together, and trying to lose weight. Yeah, lose weight. I remember at least two bulimic girls on my floor. You couldn't ignore the situation. There was no privacy. We were all together all the time. Our days were spent in training at a local elementary school transformed into a flight attendant school, complete with a full-size mock-up airplane in the gymnasium. Now, I had this idea that the majority of time in training would be spent on safety. You know, how to open the emergency door, how to use a fire extinguisher. Wrong. The first thing we learned was you had to make weight, hence the bulimic girls. Every week, we had to stand in a single file against a wall in a gymnasium beside the tail cone of a DC-9 as they called out our names. Blackburn, 5 foot 4. Ken Way, 120 pounds. Meantime, another instructor leads me to the scale, and I step on it, holding my breath each week. And then this instructor would read my weight aloud for everyone to hear. Blackburn weighs 119. And then the first instructor would confirm. Return to class. I always just made weight. It was brutal. If you didn't make weight, you were kicked out right there on the spot. They would put you in a van, drive directly to the airport, and fly you back to wherever you came from. The weigh-in was very serious and completely humiliating. I burned through two roommates because they didn't make weight. People got kicked out daily for many reasons. The wrong nail polish, earrings bigger than a quarter, not wearing a beige bra... And oh yeah, they checked. It seemed like they kicked people out just to intimidate those of us who remained. We started training with 200 people and graduated with 100 people. It was like the reality show Survivor, but instead of getting kicked off the island, you got kicked out of the hotel. There were also lots of rules. Rules about everything, especially about our uniforms. For instance, we had to wear high-heeled navy pumps at all times. The only time we could slip on our Navy flats was when we were in the air serving food or beverages. And that was also when you had to wear your serving garment or apron. But you could never wear your serving garment on takeoff or landing because then you needed to be wearing your double-breasted blazer. Come on, you guys, pay attention. To illustrate the importance of wearing your blazer and not your serving garment on takeoff and landing, during accident week, which was like shark week but with airplane crashes, We watched the Air Florida Flight 90 crash. On January 13, 1982, a Boeing 737 crashed on takeoff into the 14th Street Bridge in Washington, D.C., crushing seven occupied cars. Then it fell off the bridge and plunged through the ice into the Potomac River, sinking. It was a surreal scene with only the tail of the airplane visible and ice chunks all around. People stood along the banks of the river, helpless to save the passengers who were clawing to get out of the river. Only five people survived the crash, including a flight attendant who was pulled up out of the river by a helicopter. The flight attendant was dangling from a rope, hanging on for dear life, spinning in the air. And she was wearing her serving garment. The instructor stopped the VHS tape and said, You see? Do you see that? Is that what you want? Do you want to be on national television in your serving garment? Let me just tell you how useless all these flight attendant rules turned out to be. About six months later, after training, I was just off probation and flying from JFK to West Palm Beach. The flight was packed and I was working first class, which meant I was the lead flight attendant that day when all of a sudden a woman came up from coach between the curtains and whispered to me, Excuse me, stewardess. I just wanted to inform you that Mr. Klein in 5C just passed away. I'm sorry, what? And she replies, I'm his nurse. 
he's dead. And then she turns around, walks back through the curtains, and sits down next to him. Now this I did not remember in flight attendant training. So I go straight to the flight attendant manual, and sure enough, there's a rule. If a passenger dies on your flight, do not be alarmed and do not alert other passengers. Place an oxygen mask over their nose and mouth, adjust the elastic band around their head, and act normally. You may also want to put a blanket in their lap. So what did I do? I got an oxygen bottle and a blanket, and I headed back through the curtains and into coach. And then I saw the guy. He was sitting in the window seat, and he appeared to be about, oh, 120 or 140 years old. And he was dead, 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 dead. So I began pretending to act normally. Hey, hey, Mr. Klein, I hear you're not feeling well. I turned the little air thing on above his head. Now how about a little extra oxygen? The nurse helps me with the elastic band around his head and we get the oxygen mask on. What's that? You're a little cold? Well, here's a blanket. And then after this charade, I march back through the curtains to first class and then I step into the cockpit to tell the pilots who don't seem the least bit phased. They say they'll alert the ground, and with that, the flight continues. There really is not a lot of fanfare about it. Right before we land, I take off my serving garment, put on my double-breasted blazer, change back into my navy pumps, and I check on Mr. Klein one more time. Yep, still dead. Once we're on the ground, I assume we'll let the passengers off, and then we'll get the dead guy off. But no, 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 no. The rules say that the dead guy has to come off first. So we taxi to the gate and I open the door. They pull out the jetway and two paramedics rush in with a straight back chair and they wheel it back to 5C. The charade continues. Hey, Mr. Klein, how's it going here? They said, here you're not feeling so well. Oh, we're just going to put you here in this straight back chair. We'll put your arms around your chest and buckle you in. And then they strap his arms across his chest, tighten the belts, and literally wheel him off the plane like he's on a dolly. And what am I to do? Well, I just go by the rules, and I straighten my double-breasted blazer, and I say, "Bye, bye Mr. Klein. I hope you feel better. Thanks for flying with us. See you next time. So those were the good old days, right? I mean, yeah, sure, somebody died, but the hilarity of me handling it and having to change my shoes and my uniform blazer and my serving garment, it was a train wreck. Or should I say plane wreck? Right? Huh? Come on, you guys. No, really, you know what? I'm glad I flew. Really. I mean, in my 20s anyway. I'd recommend it to anybody, especially if you don't have kids. If you have kids, that might get a little trickier because being away from your children... But maybe not, because now everybody has a cell phone, so it's it's a little bit different. All right, you guys, i got to wrap it up. I want to thank you all so much for tuning in to my second Closet Confessional. If you didn't hear the first one, go back and listen to that one, too. And tweet me and let me know that you're listening at StoryWorthy. And, of course, feel free to email me at info at storyworthypodcast.com. And if you're really feeling kind, you can always head over to iTunes and leave me a five-star rating and a good review. I always need that. And check out past episodes of StoryWorthy with my dear friend, Hannes Finney. And join us next week on StoryWorthy for a story by writer Mark Miller called Hollywood's Circle of Life. The show business households are fairly easy to spot. There are, for your consideration, screeners and scripts sent by networks and studios, jackets and t-shirts bearing TV show and movie logos, framed movie posters, and countless books on writing, directing, producing, and acting. You guys are in for a real treat. Don't miss the incredibly talented Mark Miller next week on StoryWorthy. All right, I want to thank everybody over at Wondery Media. Thank you guys so much for your support. And especially a big thank you to all of you guys out there listening, my StoryWorthy audience. By tuning in each week, you guys are the ones that make this happen. So on behalf of all of you, thank you so much for listening. My name is Christine Blackburn saying, make it a StoryWorthy week. Thanks for joining us on the Story Worthy Podcast. We'll be back next week with all new stories.
Subscribe to StoryWorthy on iTunes and visit the StoryWorthy website at storyworthypodcast.com. I'm Major Selba, and this little journey of words is brought to you by me and Booking.com, but mostly by me. Now, imagine you're on vacation, you and your favorite peoples. Beachside bungalows, perfect weather, the smell of barbecue, barbecuing on the grill. Eh, you know the smell. Whatever your vibe is, it's probably just an easy click away, because with over 28 million places, chances are we've got the perfect place for your next trip. Come on, you know you need it. Find your perfect place to stay. Booking.com. Booking. Yeah. Thanks, everyone, for baking your way here on this toasty morning. Are you all ready to jam? Excellent. Before we get rolling, let's start by hashing out everything bagel we'll be discussing. Profit margins are okay, but they could maybe be butter. Sorry, I don't mean to waffle. Next quarter, it's all or muffin. Did you have a question, sausage patty? Um, my name's Patricia. When you can't take your mind off breakfast, it matters where you stay. Delicious breakfast available at our Hilton family of brands. Hilton, for the stay.